It's Monday, June 12th. I'm Trayvell Anderson. And I'm Juanita Tolliver, and this is What A Day, where we're still processing the departure of Padma Lakshmi from Top Chef. This is my chance. I've been trying to host Top Chef for <laughs> the longest. Shoot your shot, friend! Where do I audition? <laughs> I'm ready for my moment. Bless. And we know you're going to bring the season in, so (laughs) period. (laughs) On today's show, a section of the I-95 highway in Philadelphia collapsed on Sunday after a tanker truck caught fire. Plus, four indigenous children were found alive after 40 days of going missing in the Colombian jungle. But first, unless you've been living under a rock for the past three days or traveling to see Beyonce perform in Marseille, France, then you, like us, have been completely gagged by the explosive federal indictment that featured photos of bathroom toilets and ballroom stages covered with boxes, as well as the 37 felony counts that Trump has been charged with. Count them. Listen, 37, that's a number that you can't just explain away as this, like, political vendetta against you. But obviously Trump's going to try to do that anyway. (laughs) Of course he is. And it's not even a round number, so you know evidence is backing up every single one of these charges. Mm -hmm. According to the indictment, the charges include 31 counts of willful retention of national defense information, conspiracy to obstruct justice, withholding a document or a record, corruptly concealing concealing a document or record, concealing a document in a federal investigation, scheme to conceal, and false statements and representations. It's giving crimes on top of crimes and every Mm -hmm. bit of evidence to back it up from interviews with lower-level staffers and tape recordings of Trump showing biographers classified documents. So that makes two different cases now with clear and crisp audio of Trump criming. Mm. Naturally, just days after the indictment, Trump took a trip to Georgia and North Carolina to spread lies about the DOJ investigation, and his base ate it up, especially when a CBS poll shows that 76% of GOP primary voters believe that this indictment was politically motivated. To dig into the indictment, the severity of the charges, and what comes next on the long legal road for Trump, we talked to Kate Shaw, a professor of law at the Cardozo School of Law and co-host of Crooked's Strict Scrutiny podcast. We started by asking Kate how the hell we got here in the first place. Take a listen to what she had to say. Well, I mean, the story really starts, I think, as Donald Trump is leaving the administration after having unsuccessfully tried to unlose the election. And ultimately, on January 20th, the outgoing president leaves the White House, heads to Mar-a-Lago, and as we now know, takes with him many, many boxes of classified documents to which he has no legal right. But some months into the Trump post-presidency, the National Archives starts to realize they are missing many, many documents that should be in the possession of the United States and its agencies. Um, And so over the course of a number of months, a kind of sequence of exchanges in in which National Archives officials are trying to get voluntary relinquishment of all of these papers from the Trump operation. And essentially, there is just such slow walking and outright resistance that the National Archives makes a referral to the Department of Justice and first through requests and then through a subpoena and then through an actual search warrant to get documents after learning the voluntary compliance has been, shall we say, incomplete. We end up in a position where the special counsel, Jack Smith, has the possession of many, many classified documents that were not turned over. And those documents are essentially the heart of this indictment that we saw at the end of last week. And I feel like we should all be alarmed any time an outgoing president skips an inauguration because this is what they could be doing, like real talk. (laughs) But we know there are 37 criminal counts in total. And I saw the strict scrutiny team unboxing the indictment in real time. So please break down these charges for us. Sure. So of the 37, 31 of them are for willfully retaining what's called national defense information, mostly classified. Some of it isn't actually technically classified, but is all sensitive information that the statute called the Espionage Act, that's the statute that these 31 charges are brought under, makes unlawful to retain by somebody who doesn't have the legal right to do that. So that's both the security clearances and a need to have this information. So those 31 charges are this kind of willful retention of these materials. There's a count of conspiracy to obstruct justice. And then there are several counts of withholding and concealing documents and making false statements to investigators. And, you know, these documents have to do with things like 
nuclear capability, the intelligence operations and military planning of both the United States and foreign partners. So, you know, folks who really work in national security and intelligence world have said in kind of the starkest possible terms that information like this, when it falls into the wrong hands, causes people to die. Like the stakes could not be higher from the perspective of what is at stake. Now, a lot of people think the United States government overclassifies tons of documents. That I think is absolutely true. But it's also the case that some classified documents contain information that's really important and that it is really important to keep secret. The indictment does tell the story of the efforts of the Justice Department to get these documents and the tactics deployed by Trump and some members of his team, but mostly Trump personally, to evade his responsibility to hand these documents over, including really explicitly saying things while showing documents to third parties, like the ghostwriters of his former chief of staff's memoir. Which was um, just and wild. <laughs> it was a wild. When we were unboxing the indictment last week, just that conversation is reproduced verbatim in the indictment, in which he basically says to these writers, I have this document and I could have declassified, he says this to a staff member, I could have declassified it, but I didn't. It's still secret. Isn't that interesting? And so you have kind of almost wow. all the elements of this charge admitted to in that exchange. I know I have these documents. I know I shouldn't. I know they're classified. I know I didn't declassify the documents because some theory that's been floated by Trump's lawyers, although never actually in court, is that somehow he automatically had a standing order that every document in, you know, that left the White House was automatically declassified or that he was somehow like with his mind declassifying documents. And wow. I don't think those would be winning arguments anyway, but I, <laughs> I really think it's very hard to make that argument with a straight face after hearing his admission that he knew the documents hadn't been declassified in this exchange. Yeah. Now, Trump seems unfazed, undeterred by the news of the indictment. He even took a trip down to Georgia and North Carolina Republican conventions. I wonder what's your legal take on how Trump has responded in the days since he learned of his indictment and, you know, told the rest of the world on Truth Social about it? Well, you know, the initial polling suggests that no one in his base is troubled by this indictment, that, that actually <laughs> things that his numbers actually look like they're going up in the wake of it. And so I expect him to talk maybe not of like nothing else, but this is going to be central to his rhetoric on the campaign trail. He's going to talk about it a lot. And I don't know how that will play politically, but my strong sense is it's not going to play well legally because whatever he thinks he's going to say, you know, again, speaking in a political register, might yield benefits, might not. But if he goes out and says, yes, I had these documents... And I don't know, I had the right to because I was the president or whatever else he says. The yes, I had these documents is a very important admission that I think is, if not fatal to any defense as lawyers might want to offer, really a problem for mounting a successful defense. So I do think that there's going to be this tension between his political incentives, which are to talk about this a lot, and his lawyer's likely advice and the most you know cautious prudential legal course of action, which is to try to stay quiet. But of course, we know Trump doesn't listen to his lawyers about anything. And so I presume, um, you know, he's not it's not even totally clear who's going to represent him in this Florida. Oh, yeah. His suit. attorneys quit. Yeah. They tweeted that they quit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's looking. <laughs> Trump has made it absolutely clear that a conviction would not stop him from continuing on with his presidential bid. Like we talked about in the polling, his most ardent supporters, those GOP voters are fully turned up on the idea that this is only politically motivated. But what possible impact might a conviction and sentencing have on this presidential campaign if this case moves through the courts at warp speed? Yeah, so that's important, that last thing you said. It would have to move through at warp speed. I mean, ordinary federal litigation timing is like glacial. You know, it's slow. Mm -hmm. And so we could be talking about a couple of years, I think, in the ordinary course. Now, a couple things. One, this Florida court is known as a court that moves things along relatively expeditiously. So I think that, from the Justice Department's perspective, is helpful. And so I think a lot will turn on what this judge is willing to do. Like, does the judge agree that it's actually important that this all kind of run its course so that voters have full information when they're making their choices? Or does the judge essentially allow Trump to kind of drag out proceedings as I think everybody anticipates that he will. I mean, the identity of this judge does not give a huge amount of confidence 
if you're the Justice Department, because this judge, Judge Cannon, in a previous stage of those early proceedings we were talking about at the outset, where the Justice Department is trying to get these documents, ends up ultimately asking for and getting and executing a search warrant on Mar-a-Lago. After that, this judge basically sided with Trump in his efforts to restrict DOJ's ability to access these documents. She appointed a special master. It was a very, very sort of pro-Trump ruling in the district court that was reversed in pretty sharp terms by the appeals court. But at least, you know, in terms of the one piece of evidence we have about her likely disposition vis-a-vis Trump in this suit, this judge seems like she's going to be pretty sympathetic. Although, you know, we don't totally know what she's going to do. But if she decides to sort of help move things along quickly, you know, these are charges that carry at least in theory, very lengthy prison sentences. So if he were convicted and sentenced, we would be, you know, yet again in a new part of the uncharted water, right, of the entire sort of Trump era. Um, There's no constitutional prohibition on a convicted felon running for or serving as president, but there certainly are logistical challenges that it could present. And I mean, (laughs) if he were somehow actually sentenced to a period of incarceration and maintained his candidacy and... I mean, I can't believe I'm going to finish the sentence this way, but one, I, I don't, Ugh. we're talking possibilities here. One is a district court could basically say, well, we have to suspend this sentence so he can serve out his term as president. No, no, no. I'm sorry. It could happen. It could happen. Wow. And then, of course, I presume he would, if, you know, he gets inaugurated, I presume he would pardon himself. And then the whole thing goes away. So that at least is a possibility. It could be that if he was incarcerated and a district judge didn't do this kind of suspending the sentence, Maybe it's possible that there's a provision in the Constitution, the 25th Amendment, that basically allows a president to be stripped of their power if they cannot execute the duties of the office. But that requires the cooperation of the vice president and the cabinet. It would have to be Trump's own people agreeing that he needs to be ousted from office. So it's an enormous constitutional mess if that comes to pass. And again, that's only, I think, something we would have to grapple with if things moved much much faster than they would in their ordinary course. But I mean, we could be looking at complete chaos. And remember, this is one charge. We already have a Manhattan criminal trial scheduled for March of 2024. Mm -hmm. And we very likely will see charges out of Fulton County, Georgia by the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. And Jack Smith, the special counsel, is also investigating and could well charge Trump with his participation in January 6th in D.C. So, you know, uh, there's just so much legal jeopardy swirling around the ex-president, Donald Trump, and yet he does not seem deterred in his efforts to seek the presidency. If anything, I think he seems to be doubling down because, at least as to the federal charges, being in a position in which he could try to self-pardon all of a sudden seems really, really important. Now, we should say there's no legal precedent on the possibility. Can a president even self-pardon? We don't know. But obviously that wouldn't stop him from trying if he had the chance. That was our conversation with Kate Shaw, professor of law at the Cardoza School of Law and co-host of Crooked's Strict Scrutiny podcast. And when I tell you we went to some dark possible outcomes here, I think we all need to brace ourselves and we all need to be 1000 percent motivated to turn out in 2024. Absolutely. Of course, we'll keep following all of Trump's crimes and court cases, including his arraignment at a federal courthouse in Miami tomorrow in connection to this indictment. But that's the latest for now. We'll be back after some ads. Hey guys, this is Kenan Thompson. I have a problem with you. Yes, you. None of y'all told me that Auto Trader has millions of new and used cars that I can shop from home. I thought we were friends. I put smiles on your face, but I'm not smiling. No one told me that with Auto Trader, a dealer can deliver cars to my home or that I could shop by price on Auto Trader. No one. Consider this friendship that you just learned we had officially over. Finally, it's easy. Auto Trader. Now let's wrap up with some headlines. Headlines. An elevated section of the I-95 highway in Philadelphia collapsed on Sunday, indefinitely shutting down a heavily traveled segment of the East Coast's main north-south highway. According to authorities, a tanker truck carrying petroleum caught on fire while it was traveling underneath I-95 early Sunday morning, causing the section above it to cave in. Thankfully, no one was injured during the sudden collapse and the fire was easily contained. But the northbound lanes of I-95 in the section were pretty much dust and the southbound lanes were heavily damaged. 
Local transportation officials urged Philly drivers on Sunday to avoid the northeastern part of the city in wake of the disaster and warned them of extensive delays and street closures while they worked to clean up the mess. But they gave no timeline for when the road would reopen. U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg said his department is working with city and state leaders to support them while they rebuild. Ted Kaczynski, more widely known as the Unabomber, died by suicide over the weekend in his North Carolina prison cell. Kaczynski was the criminal mastermind behind a 17-year bombing campaign that killed three people and injured 23 others in various parts of the country between 1978 and 1996. The FBI manhunt to find Kaczynski, whose bombing sprees changed the way Americans mailed packages and boarded airplanes, was one of the longest and costliest to date. After his arrest in 1996, he pleaded guilty and was sent to a maximum security prison in Colorado, where he was given four life sentences, plus 30 years for his campaign of terror. In 2021, the Unabomber was sent to the North Carolina Federal Medical Center, a facility that treats prisoners suffering from serious health problems, and where Kaczynski was dealing with his late-stage cancer diagnosis. Kaczynski's death comes after the Federal Bureau of Prisons has faced heavier criticism and examination in recent years over the suicide death of convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein in 2019. Several WNBA players are calling for better protections around player safety after Brittany Griner was harassed at a Dallas airport on Saturday morning. Griner was traveling with her Phoenix Mercury teammates when she was yelled at and filmed by far-right social media figure Alex Stein, who later posted a clip of the encounter on Twitter. Phoenix Mercury forward Brianna Turner also took to Twitter to recount the incident, saying that the team nervously huddled in a corner together in the airport, unsure of how to navigate the situation safely. Saturday's incident brought up ongoing frustrations within the WNBA to obtain charter flights for better safety and protection of players. WNBA Commissioner Kathy Engelbert said earlier this year that it's an issue she's aware of and working on, but it's just too costly of a move for the league without sponsorships. Well, let's find some sponsorships. Somebody got to be out there. Come on. To be able to sponsor this. Come on now. Drop the coins. Right. In a statement responding to the harassment of Brittany Griner, the WNBA Players Association said, quote, everyone who was paying attention knew this would happen. We could have and should have been more proactive. We implore the league and the teams to not wait another day to change the rule regarding travel. Not a single lie detected, I promise. Four indigenous children who went missing after a small plane crash in the Amazon were found alive over the weekend after surviving for 40 days on their own in the Colombian jungle. Just soak that in for a second, because that's wild. Mm -hmm. The kids who are between the ages of 11 months and 13 years old were traveling with their mother by plane on May 1st when one of the engines failed mid-flight. The plane went down, killing the three adults on board, including their mother. And the kids were left stranded in the jungle where snakes, mosquitoes, and other wild animals roam free. The key to their survival was a stash of cassava flour they found on board the plane and their intimate knowledge of the rainforest fruits and seeds. The children, who are members of the Amazon's indigenous Witoto tribe, knew which foods were safe to eat in the wild and were able to keep themselves from starving to death. A group of Colombian soldiers discovered them in the jungle on Friday, and the kids were reunited with their families shortly after. Colombian government officials met with the children in the country's capital of Bogota, where they're expected to stay under hospital care for at least two weeks while they're rehydrated and fed. And their rescue brings a thankfully happy end to a week's long search led by community members and authorities. Huge, huge outcome. Absolutely. Love that they're safe. Love that they somehow survived with their knowledge. This is the indigeneity, you know, working to their favor, like knowing the seeds and the fruit. I feel like we have a new word, but I'm here for it. <laughs> is it? No, that's real. It's a real word. Indigeneity. Oh, I promise. Oh, my bad. Let me step it up. I think. <laughs> But also, I just want to say the fact that they survived 40 days, it's giving yellow jackets for anyone who's watching. Minus the cannibalism, obviously. Yikes. Yeah. I don't know nothing about no yellow jackets, but I know I would not have made it 40 days, period. (laughs) The city girl, no. 
And in some good historic news you might have missed last week, New York Governor Kathy Hochul appointed 15 new judges to the state's courts, one of them being the first openly trans man to sit on a judicial bench in American history. Seth Marin will soon preside over New York's state court of claims, and he has an impressive resume under his belt going into his new role. Marin currently works at Columbia University as the school's director of affirmative action and equal opportunity training and he's previously served as the vice president for civil rights at the Anti-Defamation League, a legal group dedicated to protecting the rights of marginalized communities nationwide. Marin goes on to join the ranks of trans trailblazers like Victoria Kolakowski and Andy Mudrick of California. Kolakowski became the country's first ever openly transgender judge in 2010 when she was elected to Alameda County Superior Court, and Mudrick, an out transgender woman, was appointed to Sacramento County Superior Court just last year. Love this. Keep it coming, people. Number one, another pride surprise that brings a lot of joy. Absolutely. Number two, Two, check these credentials. Columbia University, Vice President mm-hmm. of Civil Rights and Anti-Defamation League, like Seth Marin clearly is qualified, maybe even overqualified. Because let's be real, if you're coming from any type of marginalized community, you got to be that great. That's what they tell us, right? Work 10 times harder, et cetera, et cetera, Come et cetera. On. Shout out to Mr. Marin, okay? And those are the headlines. That is all for today. If you like the show, make sure you subscribe, leave a review, keep appointing and electing trans folks into office and tell your friends to listen. And if you're into reading and not just survival tips like me, What A Day is also a nightly newsletter. Check it out and subscribe at cricket.com slash subscribe. I'm Juanita Tolliver. I'm Trayvell Anderson. And and see see you in court, court, Trump. Trump. Oh my God, I can't wait. I don't even know if it's going to be televised, but you know I will be following this very closely. Mm -hmm. Listening to, watching, whatever we can get, okay, out of that courthouse. And you know what else we're going to get? Tongue-tied Republicans who can't get their lies straight. Because there ain't no way they can talk their way out of this. There's no way. Well, you know they're going to try. What a Day is a production of Crooked Media. It's recorded and mixed by Bill Lance. Our show's producer is Itzi Quintanilla. Raven Yamamoto and Natalie Bettendorf are our associate producers, and our senior producer is Lita Martinez. Our theme music is by Colin Gilliard and Kashaka. Hey guys, this is Keenan Thompson. I have a problem with you. Yes, you. None of y'all told me that AutoTrader has millions of new and used cars that I can shop from home. I thought we were friends. I put smiles on your face, but I'm not smiling. No one told me that with AutoTrader, a dealer can deliver cars to my home or that I could shop by price on AutoTrader. No one. Consider this friendship that you just learned we had officially over. Finally, it's easy. AutoTrader.